Greetings, brothers and sisters. We greet you with the apostolic greeting of the first century church. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Bible study this evening. Thank you so much for participating. We have been looking for more than a year now at the book of Ephesians under the subject, the sovereign God and, well, under the heading, the, sub, the sovereign God and the mystery of his will. This evening we begin lesson 92 and our subject is Be Filled with the Spirit part three. So this is our third go at this subject area, be filled with the Spirit. And I hope you will be able to appreciate that we are being as thorough as, as we can, because this, this passage, this little section here, um, beginning with this verse, verse 18, be filled with the Spirit is so important. Um, in fact, everything in the Christian life, if we are to make success of it, it, it will depend on our being filled with the Spirit. We are reading this evening Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let us pray. Lord, there are more things that we do not know than what we know. Please teach us this evening, Lord. Please show us wonderful things out of your word. Please cause us to hear your voice. Please cause our hearts and minds to be stayed on you. Please Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we desperately need your help, your, your filling, not just to speak and to hear, but to live out the great truth which we are learning and will learn. Thus, Lord, we we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Adrian Pierce Rogers was an American pastor and author who served three terms as president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Commenting on Paul's command to the believers in Ephesus to be filled with the Spirit, Rogers made the following observations, and I quote, and just let me say that sometimes, many times, we quote from the works of theologians whom we respect, and we do so because they say um, things 
in a far more effective way than I can. And so I'm not ashamed to use their voices to help to make my points a little more clearly because at the end of the day, what I want is for you to understand what God is trying to say to us. So I don't have to pretend as if I can say it better than men and sometimes women who are far more able than I am. So Roger says, imagine that a man had bought a new car. He invites his friends over to see the flawless paint job, to sit in the soft seats. But everywhere he goes, he has to push it, which can be extremely exhausting. So rather than being a good thing, his car is really more of a burden. But then one day, someone introduces him to the ignition. He discovers that if you put the car in drive, it can surge forth in power. Why didn't somebody tell me about this before, he asks. Nobody could be that dumb, you say, unless that person is a Christian who does not understand the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Many Christians don't understand that when they got saved, God implanted an engine into their salvation. I don't mean any disrespect by calling the Holy Spirit an engine, but he is the dynamism, the power of our Christian life. Some people are like the man and his car. Rather than salvation carrying them they're the ones always pushing it, grinding out their Christian experience because they haven't yet discovered the wonderful, spirit-filled life. Is that how it is with us, brothers and sisters? Are we trying to push our Christianity up Mount Rasa? Have we found out that there is an engine built into our salvation that is there to work for us so that we don't have to work so hard? Are we finding Christianity to be hard work? Are we becoming depressed? Rogers goes on to say, the spirit will turn your drudgery into dynamism rather than making Christianity a burden he will make it an empowering blessing to you I believe far more harm is done in our churches by people who are not spirit filled than by people who are drunks far more harm is done by people who are trying to do the work of God in their own flesh. Let me say that, well, let me add that a lot of danger is done by persons who we think are spirit-filled and who may even think that they are spirit-filled because they went through a process where they had to work something up. And they always have to be working something up in order to make something happen. The first reason for being filled with the Holy Spirit is obedience. Being filled with the Spirit is not a good idea, not a suggestion. It is an imp- 
imperative if we are to be obedient to the Lord. The second reason for being filled is because of your obligations to help you accomplish the tasks that are before you. Many people think, if I just knew what I was supposed to do, then I'd have it made. No, just knowing what to do is not enough. You also need the power to do what you know you ought to do. You can't do it alone. You need the Spirit's empowerment. How can you be filled with the Spirit? It is not your responsibility to persuade God to fill you with His Spirit. Brethren, based on where we are coming from and what we were taught, I want to read this again. It is not your responsibility to persuade God to fill you with his spirit. Many people think, if I could just persuade God to fill me with his spirit, I could finally walk in victory. No. It is not your job to talk him into it. It is your job to permit him to do it. God wants to fill you with his spirit. It is his desire to do so. He longs for you to live in the power, freedom, and victory that he alone can provide you. If you have trusted him for salvation through Jesus Christ, his spirit already lives within you. Now, let him have all of you. One of the requirements for being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we bow to him in full surrender. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with his life. The Spirit of the living God. Is there any area of your life that is out of bounds to the Holy Spirit? Your financial life? Your sexual life? Your personal life? Your career ambitions? Your recreational hobbies? Anything? Anywhere to be filled with the Spirit means that there is a person who is completely occupying the temple, the sanctuary of your life, every room, every desk drawer, the key to every closet. Everything now belongs to him. That's what it means, a complete commitment. You just turn the keys over to him. Are you ready to do that? Unquote. Are we ready to turn over every area of our lives to the Holy Spirit? That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to have one's mind completely under the Holy Spirit's divine control. Being filled with the Spirit parallels allowing the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. Colossians 3.16 and we looked at this in some detail last week, I hope we remember. When our minds are saturated with, immersed in, and surrendered to God's word, his spirit will control and dominate us. The fruit of the spirit will be produced in our lives and our speech and behavior will testify that we are spirit-filled. 
It is not a matter of available power. For God's supplies are infinite. Rather, it is a matter of available will. It is a matter of our willingness, my willingness, your willingness to surrender to the influences and control of the indwelling spirit. The more willing we are to surrender to the influences and control of the indwelling spirit, the more the spirit's power becomes available to us. You see, we really want to exercise the spirit's power, but maybe we are not so eager to be under the spirit's influence and control. But the way to be able to have more of the Spirit's power available to us is to be more and more under His control, under His dominance. In 1 John 5, 7, and I was just thinking about this just before I completed my notes, I just stuck this in. It has been in my mind for a little while and I've been trying to find a way to talk about it. I haven't even studied it um, very thoroughly, but for years now it has been in my mind. In 1 John 1, chapter 5, and sorry, in 1 John 1 and verse 5, 1 John 1 and verse 5. This is what John writes. Now this is the gospel message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. New English translation. John says that the message, the gospel message, the gospel message that we heard about God from Jesus Christ is that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, no darkness at all, no spot, no blot, no hint of darkness. Darkness in him does not exist even one bit. Now in Luke chapter 11, verses 34 to 36, Luke writes, and again, I'm quoting from the New English translation, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is diseased, your body is full of darkness. Now, the ancients understood vision to involve the process of light coming into the body from outside. Light, therefore, became a metaphor for teaching. So, um, John is saying, sorry, Luke is saying, is, is representing Jesus to be saying that when, when your eyes healthy, that means when your entire being is healthy, your whole body is full of light. It is good teaching, correct teaching, some doctrine that causes light to flood the body, so to speak. But when it is diseased, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, see to it that the light in you is not darkness. See to it that the teaching you are receiving is correct. See to it that the teachers who teach you are teaching sound doctrine. That their teaching is not emotionally based, not hyped to get you into a certain state of mind. Not to get you excited. They are not telling you that your chair is anointed and that you are not able to sit on your chair because apparently the chair is more anointed than you are. They are teaching you from God's word. 
see to it that the light in you is not darkness. But here's what I really want to say. Verse 36. If then your whole body is full of light with no part in the dark. See, this is when now we become like God. Remember, John tells us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 that the message that Jesus brought to his disciples about God is that he's light. And in him there is no darkness. And so John is saying, if then your whole body, if your entire being is full of sound teaching, if you are being taught correct doctrine with no part in the dark, you see, it is, it is the will of God for us to be like him, having no part dark. No part dark. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That is the destiny of the children of God. One day we will be like that and we must desire that. We must pray for that. We must earnestly want that to have no part dark. And so we must be excited about correct teaching. We must crave after sound Bible teaching. We must believe sound Bible teaching and we must apply it. John Phillips makes the following insightful comments and I quote, As we begin to read the word of God, the spirit of God brings some divine truth to our attention. A promise to claim, a sin to confess and avoid, a command to obey. Because we have established the basic premise that Jesus is Lord and made that the foundation for all our behavior, our immediate response is to obey. Let me read that again. This is critical. Because we have established the basic premise that Jesus is Lord and made that, that is made the premise that Jesus is Lord, the foundation for all our behavior, our immediate response is to obey. We yield on whatever issue in the word of God, the spirit of God has brought to our attention. As we yield, he fills us and we receive the power to turn that teaching into practical reality. As this process continues, the Holy Spirit enlarges our horizons, increases our capacity, deepens our spirituality and enables us to grow in grace and increase our knowledge of God. Brothers and sisters, have we in our personal lives established the basic premise that Jesus is Lord? And have we made that the foundation for all our behavior? If we have, then our consistent response to the Holy Spirit will be one of obedience. If we have not, then we will not yield consistently to the Holy Spirit. And our obedience to him will be sporadic, irregular at best. We all need to honestly ask ourselves the following question. Is Jesus Christ truly Lord of my life? The New English translation renders John 13, 12 to 14 in the following way. So when Jesus had washed their feet and put his outer clothing back on, 
he took his place at the table again and said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and do so correctly, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, then you too ought to wash one another's feet. There's an important principle in this that I'm going to try to bring out. In verse 13, our Lord says, you, that is the disciples, referring to the disciples, you call me teacher and Lord and do so correctly for that is what I am. He did not say, I am your teacher and Lord, but rather you call me teacher and Lord. He then proceeded to instruct them based on their confessed view of him. The order in which these titles occur is significant. The disciples had come to know Christ first as their teacher. It was only afterwards that they came to know him as their Lord. But in verse 14, Jesus reverses the order. He says, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. Why did he reverse the order? They called him teacher and Lord. But he says, I am your Lord and teacher. Why did he reverse the order? Because this is the experimental order. No. We must first surrender to him as Lord, bowing to his supreme authority and submitting to his yoke before he will be able to successfully teach us. If we view him primarily as our teacher, we will not necessarily feel an obligation to obey his teaching. But if we acknowledge him as Lord first, then we are obligated to obey his every word. You see, brethren, maybe for some of us, Jesus is our teacher. He may be our savior, but he may not be our Lord. You see, so we can choose which of his teachings we will accept and which we will reject. The ones that suit us are the ones we will perhaps um, decide to obey. But if there are some that we don't think are right, we can reject them because he's just a teacher. He's just a savior. But if he is our Lord then we have an obligation to live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Do you see that, brethren? It's very important. That's why we ask the question, is Jesus our Lord? Those of us who worship at the Grace Workshop Ministries must ensure that we recognize and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord first and then as teacher. As the word of God dwells in us richly and controls all our thinking and our behavior, as we walk in obedience to the word, the spirit of God fills, dominates, and controls us to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if we desire to be filled with the spirit, we must not tolerate anything in our lives which is contrary to the word of God. Is there anything in my life and yours that is contrary to the word of God? 
then we have a responsibility to confess and forsake such a thing. To be filled with the Holy Spirit does not necessarily result in an overwhelming emotional experience. We believe, many of us, that that is what ought to happen because we were taught that that is what ought to happen. And our practice was to try and make that happen. But, 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 when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it may not result in an overwhelming emotional experience. It will result in a state of being controlled. That is the important thing. When we are filled, we will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It results in a state of orderliness and common sense. In Second Timothy Chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul writes, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. New English translation. Harry Ironside made the following observations as it relates to our subject. Quote, What is the filling with the Holy Spirit? I think the thought that a great many people have is that it is some strange, ecstatic, emotional experience that comes to them at a given moment and then later passes away and has to be repeated again. But that is not it. This is the normal experience of the Christian life. You will perhaps um, have been sensitive brothers and sisters to realize how many times we have said this thing over and over again in different ways. Let me go on with Ironside. I have been in some places where people talk a great deal about the fullness of the Spirit and where I have seen things that I never would have thought possible a few years ago outside of an insane asylum. People rolling upon the floor and raving like maniacs and yet calling that the fullness of the spirit. That is not the spirit of a sound mind. The man who is filled with the Holy Spirit does not go off into some wild fanatical state but walks thoughtfully and carefully with God, and his testimony has power with men. Unquote. In verse 19, Paul writes, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It is very interesting, at least I find it very interesting, that the first evidence noted by Paul that identifies a person who is filled with the Spirit is the character of their speech. In other words, our speech is a good measuring instrument of the extent to which we are under the influence and control of the Holy Spirit. You remember James saying that if a man is able to control his tongue, then he is able to control his entire body. Such a man is a spirit-filled man. Such a woman is a spirit-filled woman. When a believer is filled with the Spirit, his or her heart overflows with thankfulness to God. And that overflowing expresses itself in singing. The Christian faith is by far the most joy-inspiring of all faiths, which is the reason why there are so many Christian hymnals and songbooks. The phrase, speaking to yourselves, is a translation of two Greek words which literally mean speaking with yourselves. 
But this translation is open to the misinterpretation that Paul is commanding each Christian to commune with himself or herself. That's what I believed. That is what I believed. This is not his idea. What Paul has in mind is the communion of believers with each other. Saints are to speak to one another in their worship, in their singing. The New English translation renders the verse as follows. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord. Believers are to communicate their joy in salvation to their fellow believers in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They are to find expression to the spirit-filled life in this way. This clearly indicates that as far as Paul is concerned, the spirit-filled life is not to be measured solely by one's private morality or even by one's private spiritual experience, but also by how one conducts himself or herself with other believers. If we are not impacting our brothers and sisters positively, if we are not treating them as fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow children of God, then we can't say that we are filled with the Spirit. It doesn't matter how much time we are spending in prayer and Bible reading. All of our devotional exercises must translate to a great transformation in the way we live. Throughout this epistle, Paul stresses over and over again the importance of every member of the body of Christ understanding the vital importance of every other member and therefore striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit. In Lesson 55, we made the following remarks, and I quote, Christian growth and development does not occur in isolation. God's people come into the unity of the faith, not as individuals, but together. It is not a goal to be attained by a select few elite saints only, but by all believers. And it will be fully attained by all believers when our Lord returns. If an individual believer is to mature fully, he or she needs the fellowship of other believers. This is the gospel Brothers and sisters, the idea of an arm or a leg of a physical body developing in isolation from the other members of the body is ridiculous. In the same way, it is not possible for any member of the mystical body of Christ to attain full spiritual maturity apart from the rest of the body. When Christ returns, the entire church will arrive at complete maturity or glorification. We need each other. We need each other. I need you. You need me. It is not possible for me to come to Christ-like maturity without you. It is not possible for you to attain spiritual maturity without me. Let's refresh our memory as it relates to this matter 
by reading four passages from this epistle. Passages which we have already dealt with, all reflecting the rendering of the New English translation. Ephesians 2, 14 to 22. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups into one. The one who made both groups into one and who destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility, when he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace one new man out of two, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that is the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, that is the Jews, so that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in him. The whole building being joined together joined together the whole building grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together built together not built separately but built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit Ephesians 3 14 to 19 for this reason I kneel before the father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he will grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you will be able to understand with all the saints. Paul doesn't say you will be able to, to comprehend in isolation. You will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you will be filled up to all the fullness of God. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that we will not be able to know the love of Christ. We will not be able to be filled up to all the fullness of God if we are not united because this happens to all the saints, not just to one saint in isolation. It happens when the body is united. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, I therefore the prisoner for the Lord urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace there is one body. I don't care which denomination you are from. I don't care what the name of your church is. I don't care what the name of your organization is. There is one body, the church, and one spirit. Just as you two were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he himself gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry that is to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. It is something that we all have to attain together until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, a mature person attaining to the measure of Christ's full statue. So we are no longer to be children tossed back and forth by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of people who craftily carry out their deceitful schemes. But practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him, the whole body grows. From him, the whole body grows. Not one particular part. Fitted and held together through every supporting ligament as each one does its part. The body builds itself up in love. Brothers and sisters, um, if you and if I don't understand that we need each other, then we haven't learned much and we haven't grown much. In this epistle, this epistle to the Ephesians, in addition to speaking generally of how believers are to relate to each other, the apostle highlights three sets of relationships, that of wives to husbands and husbands to wives, that of children to parents and parents to children, and that of slaves to masters and masters to slaves. Paul says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord. The Greek word translated speaking is laleo in its most basic sense. Laleo simply means to use the voice to make a sound. And in the context of Ephesians 5.19 the sound is a song. These song sounds are the products of a spirit-filled heart. The songs that please the Lord are the songs that come from a spirit-filled heart. The present tense indicates that the singing is the spirit-filled believer's lifestyle. When a person is born again or born from above, there is a sense in which music is born again in his or her spirit. And as he or she is continually filled with the spirit, there will be continually songs of praise springing up from a deep place within him or her. In all likelihood, Paul is referring here to the gathering of first century believers for corporate worship. The heathen festivals were noted for intemperate revelry and song. But the Christian congregation was to set an example of worship dedicated to an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, thrice holy God. Someone has observed that there is nothing that comes nearer to the door of heaven than the corporate singing of a group of spirit-filled 
believers. Tertullian writing from North Africa toward the end of the second century has described a Christian feast at which each is invited to sing to God in the presence of others from what he knows of the Holy Scripture or from his own heart. Paul understood that there is a horizontal dimension, a horizontal dimension, not just vertical, but a horizontal dimension to the worship of believers. In praising God, believers should consciously be directing their worship to the edification of other believers. As Christ ministers to others by extending himself for them, when we worship with the needs of others as our concern, then we are ministering Jesus Christ to our fellow believers. We are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. What the distinctions are between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs has been considerably disputed, and it would therefore not be wise for us to differentiate too strictly between them. Paul probably uses the three words here with a view to rhetorical force. He desires to emphasize the importance importance of believers gathering together for corporate worship and he wants to emphasize that when they gather together for corporate worship singing all of them singing corporate singing is to be an integral aspect of their worship i think i'm going to stop here i have more to say but i'm going to stop here and maybe just pick up with this lesson, uh, um, maybe just bring it to a conclusion next week, Lord willing, and, and say a little more concerning this. Let's pray. Oh God, we have, I believe, come to understand in a much clearer way how desperately we need you. But you are also teaching us how desperately we need each other. Oh Lord, help us for our own benefit to understand how important it is for us to be in fellowship, koinonia, with each other, uh, sharing in the common interests of each other. Oh God, help us to see how much we need each other. None of us can be brought to Christ-like maturity without you and without each other. This is what you have ordained. I guess you could have done it another way if you wanted, but this is what you wanted to do. Lord, help us to understand that if we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, this is an impossibility. It is as we surrender to your spirit that we are able to appreciate some of these wonderful truths. Lord, help us to be filled with your spirit, filled with your word, walking in the light of your word, that walk, walking based on our feelings, not walking based on what we can see, but walking based on the revelation of your word. In doing so, we will be filled with your spirit. 
We thank you for your ongoing instruction of us. Continue to teach us out of your word and give us the grace to believe and to obey. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.